Arms Corps, Rock Island Armory is well known for their 1911 pistols, having manufactured them since 1984. Since that time, Arms Corps Rock Island Armory has also manufactured shotguns, revolvers, and ammunition for such. Of the current lineup at this time, of nine revolvers, the M200 is but one, and is the only one with a four inch barrel that is chambered for the venerable 38 Special cartridge. Intended for the budget minded, the M200 can serve for personal protection, recreational shooting, and concealed carry. I really wasn't interested in this revolver, but ran across quite a few video reviews of it and decided that maybe it was worth looking at. It's not a new gun, having been out for a number of years, but it's a new gun to me and this is my take on it. Would I carry one and would I recommend one to others? So let's dig into the M200 and reveal facts and foibles regarding the revolver. I have watched unboxing reviews of this revolver and all came in a nice hard plastic box with eggshell foam padding. This revolver, however, did not. This one came in a cardboard box with the usual user guide, security lock, wired cases, cylinder chamber shield, promotional material, and read before handling tag. But this box also included a soft padded case in which to store the revolver. Taking stock of the M200 itself, the barrel length is 4 inches as compared to the 2 inch barrel of its stubby brother, the M206, and is bored and rifled for the 38 Special cartridge only. The muzzle end of the barrel does exhibit a crowned muzzle, but not as nicely crowned as is with the M206 snub nose version. Surprisingly, the M206 has a very nice crown. And why this was not carried over to the M200 is a good question to ask. Cost cutting perhaps? In my line of thinking, a 4 inch barrel is more susceptible to muzzle damage than a 2 inch barrel. But that's just my line of thinking. However, could it be that a 4 inch barrel doesn't need as much crowning as a 2 inch barrel? To be accurate? I don't know. Somebody help me understand. The barrel sports a long ramped front sight void of anti-glare serrations. The end of the sight ramp nicely aligns with the contoured beginning of the partial ejector rod shroud that provides a nice aesthetic touch. The barrel, as is the frame, is black parkerized for protection. While not pretty, parkerization does provide adequate protection from most environments. The parkerizing seems to be applied well, overall. With that said, expect the parkerized finish to wear at the high points of the revolver, such as the muzzle, frame edge, trigger guard, etc. And with that said, there is a hint on the front lower edge of the barrel at the muzzle end and a portion of the front sight edge that might not have received the full parkerized treatment. The barrel is marked on the left side with the model number and caliber. No markings are on the right side of the barrel but the top strap of the frame consists of the serial number, and the manufacturer's information is stamped just above the trigger on the frame lower. The cylinder rotates to the right like a Colt revolver during the firing cycle. Cylinder lockup is provided at the bottom and rear, as is common with most revolvers, except Ruger. Let's talk about the flash cap for a minute, which is the distance between the forcing cone and the face of the cylinder otherwise known as the cylinder gap. The flash gap can be a dangerous place for the fingers of the support hand to be. The tighter the flash gap, the better. However, too close of a flash gap can cause cycling problems, as buildup on the face of the cylinder can cause the cylinder to bind. On all of my revolvers, the flash gap is measured with each chamber aligned with the bore, in other words, in full lockup. If the face of the cylinder is machined properly, there should be no differences in this gap. While rare, out-of-tolerance cylinder faces do exist. 
When revolvers are fired, especially after many, many rounds, the forcing cone may exhibit signs of wear that result in a widened flash gap. Civil War era Colt single action revolvers, which did not have a top strap, were notorious for shooting out, a term that referred to a revolver having too wide of a flash gap to the point that the revolver became unsafe to shoot. Brass framed revolvers were more prone to shooting out than steel frame revolvers, which incidentally made the Remington and Smith & Wesson revolvers favored over Colt revolvers. That is, until 1873, when Colt introduced the Colt single action revolver that we know today. Another aspect of the cylinder gap is loss of velocity due to the gap. Although nobody that I am aware of can say how much velocity is actually lost due to cylinder gap. Today, a typical cylinder gap runs six or seven thousandths of an inch. I have read where a top measurement of 0.008 inch and a lower measurement of 0.004 inch are deemed as the maximum distances before a revolver is deemed unusable. However, revolvers have been fired when exceeding these limits. In a way, the cylinder gap on my particular M200 measured out at 0.006 inch. Another concern with revolvers is cylinder side play or lateral play. It is rare to find a cylinder without side play, and most have a few thousands of it when in full lockup. Some side play may be necessary. When the bullet leaves the case and enters the forcing cone, some cylinder free play is healthy for the revolver as the cylinder is forced to line up with the forcing cone thus reducing some wear on the forcing cone. With the M200, there is a very slight amount of lateral movement, but none that I would consider excessive. Revolver timing. Now that is a real issue, or it can be. As the hammer is forced to the rear, either through a pull of the trigger in double action mode, or by cocking the hammer in single action mode, a whole bunch of mechanical things have to happen to rotate the cylinder align the chamber to the barrel, and lock things up when that happens. When the trigger is being pulled, or when the hammer is being cocked, a locking lug within the frame releases the cylinder, which allows it to turn. In the case of the RIA M200, cylinder rotation is to the right, like a Colt double action revolver. The locking lug should re-engage the cylinder just before full lockup at which the locking lug falls into a detent in the cylinder. If the timing is too soon, and which forces the spring-loaded locking lug against the side of the cylinder, you begin to see the mark of the locking lug on the outer surface of the cylinder. If late timing exists, the locking lug may not engage the cylinder detent at the proper time. Timing can be adjusted by an armor that knows what they are doing. The M200 that I have exhibits a bit of early timing, but it is not a deal breaker, nor would I spend the money for the work of a gunsmith to correct, as long as the cylinder releases and locks up when need be. The M200 simply needs to go bang when I need it to. The cylinder release, like that found on Colt double action revolvers, is pulled to the rear to release the cylinder. When the revolver is new, the cylinder release is a bit rough to pull, but does smooth out with some use. The cylinder takes some cycling in and out of the frame to loosen up a bit. I cringe every time I see somebody bogart a cylinder. That is, slamming an open cylinder into the frame with a flick of the wrist. That places excessive wear on the cylinder catch. Just don't do that. The cylinder holds six rounds of 38 Special only. The M200 is not plus P rated, as advised by the manufacturer. The manufacturer, however, does claim that limited firing of plus B ammunition can be done. My defensive carry ammunition for the 38 Special is standard velocity 158 grain lead semi wide cutter hollow point when I can find it. The cylinder accepts speed loading and the HKS DS-A works well. The comparable Safari Land Comp 2 not so much. More on that later. The ejector rod works as it should and is long enough to clear 38 special fired cases from the chambers. The ejector rod is gritty when new 
but with planing, proper lubrication, and use, it frees up nicely. The extractor star, or sometimes called the ratchet, is recessed but not flush with the cylinder, so shells are exposed at the top of the cylinder base and can be readily seen when the revolver is loaded. Moving to the rear, you will find the hammer that, to me, sits a bit low, too low in my opinion. It has a low to no arch to it as compared to hammers on other revolvers that I have. The hammer somewhat reminds me of the Colt Bisley hammer without the style, which rides low so that it can be easily reached by the thumb for single action firing or for decocking the revolver. I can see where this hammer would snag on clothing should you carry the revolver IWD. To mitigate this possibility, one would have to cover the hammer with the thumb when drawing from the holster. The hammer spur is wide and serrated for providing a good surface of which to engage with the thumb of either hand. With the provided grips, which I talk about in a bit, the spur of the hammer will not engage the web of the hand, as the web of the hand is far enough away to prevent that from happening. The hammer strikes a free-floating internal firing pin, rather than the firing pin being part of the hammer. In conjunction with a long and heavy trigger pull, a hammer block safety prevents the firearm from firing unless the trigger is pulled in both double and single action modes. Just below the serrated cylinder latch, you will find a Rock Island Armory logo that is also carried forward to the grips. Moving further to the rear and down, we have the grips. Ah, yes, the grips. Seemingly made out of polymer material that is somewhere between a soft rubber grip and a hard plastic grip, they are a bit thin for my taste. I prefer a more rounded grip girth. The narrow grip of the M200 cuts into the palm of my hand, but is not obtrusive to the hand. The grip is comparable to the Pacmire grips that are found on many revolvers and exhibits a slight palm swell, which is fine with me. The top of the grip panels, as mentioned, has the Rock Island Armory logo. The front of the grip has molded finger grooves that, for my hand, seem to be spaced about right. For me, I like finger groove grips, as they seem to work for me and they provide an indexing point when pulling the firearm from a holster. The top of both grips is relieved of material, and the left grip is relieved of material to accommodate loading, with or without a speed loader and unloading of the cylinder, and also serves as a place for the thumb to rest during shooting. The seam of the grip handles, while not perfectly matched, is not a deal breaker as some make it out to be. For the purpose of the M200 and the price point, the provided grips are just fine, in my humble opinion. The grip's rear profile is round rather than square, which aids in concealing the revolver should you decide to do so. Note that the frame is a square butt design, which can be seen after removing a grip panel. The top of the grip at the rear is slightly lower than the top of the frame. I like to get as high a hold on the grip as possible, or come up over the top of the grip. While I use a conventional grip on a revolver, I prefer a thumb over grip that keeps my support hand well out of the way of the flash gap, and also aids in recoil management when shooting for accuracy. Rolling forward, we come to the trigger, which is housed nicely within a rounded trigger guard. The trigger itself is a rounded and curved affair void of serrations. The movement of the trigger is an upward arc rather than straight back, as would be found on, say, a 1911 pistol. The trigger is not in line with the trigger finger, which forces the shooter to pull the trigger at an inward and upward angle anyway if the shooter has a high grip on the firearm. The M200 is a double action, single action revolver. The first shot and subsequent shots thereafter come with pulling the trigger, which automatically cocks and releases the hammer in double action mode, or by manually cocking the hammer and then pulling the trigger in single action mode. Some refer to a DASA revolver as semi-automatic. That, in a sense, is correct. Double action remote requires a heavier and longer pull of the trigger while trying to keep the sights aligned with the target when doing so. By the way, 
The rear sight of the M200 is a simple, non-adjustable notch in the top of the frame, which may exciting the M200 and experience in itself. Some call the rear sight a combat sight, and it has been around for a very long time. Getting back to the trigger, the double action trigger pull weight is 8 pounds 12.1 ounces with a 5 pole average. It seems to be fairly grit free when new and is relatively smooth for an out of the box trigger. Use of course will smooth things out quite a bit. When in single action mode, the hammer is cocked and the trigger is more to the rear than with the double action mode. In single action mode, the sole purpose of the trigger is to simply release the hammer and trigger pull weight is much lighter than when using the double action mode. Single action trigger pull weight on the M200 is 2 pounds and 5 ounces with a 5 pull average. In single action mode, the trigger brake is crisp with no signs of over travel. The overall look of the M200 is reminiscent of many Colt and K-Frame Smith & Wesson revolvers. The overall length is 8.875 inches. Overall width is 1.5 inches. The overall height is 5.46 inches and the unloaded weight is 1.76 pounds. A quick note about the overall width. The overall width of a Glock G21 is 1.34 inches. That's only 0.16 inch thinner than the M200. The overall width of the M200 is measured only at the cylinder, not the entire gun, like the Glock G21. With the features out of the way, let's quickly talk about maintaining the M200. As far as maintaining the M200, I am simply going to call up a third party to parrot a portion of the user manual. For the revolver to function safely and reliably, it is essential to keep it always in good condition by making it free of rust, dirt, grease and firing residues. It is important to clean and lubricate the gun to avoid rusting of metal parts after firing and before storing. Doing the job requires no disassembly of mechanism parts. Under normal cleaning purposes, removal of the cylinder crane link assembly is sufficient. To clean the revolver when not fired or after prolonged storage, rub the external parts with a slightly oiled rug and then swab out the bore and cylinder chamber with a flannel patch. Remove excess oil but leave a slight film to protect the metal from rusting. Clean all crevices with a nylon or brass. Do not over lubricate. To clean the revolver after firing, scrub the bore and the cylinder with gun cleaning solvent, preferably nitro solvent, and then use a brush dipped in solvent to remove the powder and primer residues. Areas to be cleaned are from around the breech of the cylinder, ejector, barrel bore and other adjacent areas which have been subjected to the residue. If there are head residues or foreign matters left inside the barrel or chambers, scrub these parts further with brass brush dipped in powder solvent. After cleaning the gun with solvent, remove all traces of the solvent and apply a light film of oil immediately thereafter. It is normal to find residues in the barrel and cylinder within 24 hours to 48 hours after initial cleaning. These can be removed with bristle brush and a slight reapplication of solvent, after which slight oil should be reapplied on all surface. While you may not be able to clean the inside of the frame, that should not stop you from cleaning the outside, barrel, and cylinder chambers with your favorite solvents and in a manner of your choosing. The revolver has been shot at the factory and the barrel will be dirty. The M200 may leach out lubricant the first time that you fire it or even after multiple range days. That is normal and can be wiped off. I will mention one area that is sometimes forgotten during cleaning and that is under the extractor star. When shooting somewhat dirty ammunition, burnt gunpowder and particles can get trapped under the extractor star, and sometimes to the point that you will not be able to close the cylinder. I always carry a toothbrush with me in my range bag for cleaning under the extractor stars when firing revolvers and extractors when shooting pistols. 
Compressed air in a can also works. However, can compressed air can also contain moisture. I would use brushing over compressed air. If you do feel it necessary to strip the M200 down completely, I have provided a link in the description for a source to view, as this process is beyond the scope of this presentation. Dry firing is an excellent way to work on shooting skills like trigger and breath control without expending expensive ammunition. I recommend doing so with snap caps, which act as a buffer for the firing pin. Prior to actually shooting the M200, I spent quite a bit of time dry firing just to get used to what the M200 was telling me, and it actually taught me quite a lot. When a revolver is new and just out of the box, I don't care how expensive or inexpensive the revolver is. Internal parts need to adjust to each other. While each component has its job, all components must work in concert in order for the firearm to be not only functional, but reliable. Two methods of pulling the trigger in double action mode were used. One, pull the trigger evenly and continuously until the hammer falls and then completely release the trigger. And two, Pull the trigger to the staging point, hold for a bit, and then complete the pull to release the hammer. Pulling the trigger evenly and continuously until the hammer falls takes you past the staging point, which can be readily felt during the trigger pull. At the staging point, you will feel the cylinder fall into place. While dry firing, you will also hear the cylinder click into place. There is also a slight wall that you will feel at the staging point. The feeling that you get in the trigger finger when pushing past this wall tells you a lot about what is going to happen next. The trigger will either continue its journey to releasing the hammer or may hang up and not allow any more rear movement of the trigger. If the latter occurs, don't force the trigger to the rear. Rather, release the trigger fully and begin another trigger pull cycle. Note what chamber was affected and continue pulling the trigger until that chamber comes up next in the firing order. When it does, determine if the hang up occurs again. It may or may not. Like the former, working the stacking point may or may not be consistent. Working the stacking point helps build trigger pull consistency. The M200 is, surprisingly, pretty consistent in telling me where the stacking point is. Don't dry fire the M200 by pulling the trigger as fast as you can. That is not a good thing to do, even on expensive revolvers. Revolvers, like pistols, do need a break-in period. The amount of time needed to get all things internal, and you, working in concert. That takes time and patience. I have watched too many videos from too many reviewers who take the M200 to the range without an adequate break-in evaluation and then complain that the revolver is malfunctioning. Well, who's in charge here? An inanimate object or the person operating it? In a way, enough of that rant. Satisfying myself after 500 or so dry fire trigger pulls, I felt confident enough to get the M200 to the range. So let's do that and see what happened. Thirty-eight special ammunition is nice to have for a revolver chambered for it. Actually, I had very little thirty-eight special ammunition. I did have thirty-eight special plus P ammunition that I keep reserved for my three fifty-seven Magnum revolvers, and which would stay reserved for them. So, some standard thirty-eight special ammunition was purchased for this trial of the M two hundred. I had Magtech one hundred fifty-eight grain LRN. 
Fiocchi 158 grain FMJ, a handful of older PPU 158 grain SWC, and I was trying Remington 130 grain FMJ for the first time in any revolver. Now, before I get too deep into range stick, I need to mention that prior to purchasing the M200, a lot of time was spent reading articles and viewing video reviews on this revolver. While some reviews went smooth as glass, others highlighted a failure to fire in multiple instances. Some FTFs were, seemingly, caused by revolver timing, while other FTFs seemingly caused by ammunition differences, wherein some ammunition fired without failure while some did not. While I could not tell from dry firing if light primer strikes were going to be an issue, I did observe that the hammer seemed consistent when it fell. That's the best that I could hope for. Now, as with pistols, revolvers can be picky about what ammunition is being fed through them. Hammer inertia and primer hardness can seriously affect whether a firearm is going to fire or not. I had to run the M200 with the stock hammer spring and factory ammunition primers and take my chances. At a combat distance of 7 yards, the M200 did very well for a budget revolver in both double action and single action modes, if I did my part. I dare to say that it would be on par with any of my 4 inch double action single action revolvers for the most part, and after more break in time and use. Mozambique drills were run in double action mode only. The M200 would be a good choice for those who would not like to use their more expensive revolvers as personal defense companions, especially since you may have to turn that revolver over to law enforcement should you use it for the intended purpose, self-defense. It could also be used as a vehicle for teaching someone the rudiments of shooting a revolver for the first time or as a practice vehicle for honing those learned skills. Overall, the first range day trial of the M200 was a good experience. The M200 fed, fired, and extracted without an issue. The HKS D-A speed loader made replenishing the cylinder an easy task, as did speed strips, just not as fast. The Safari Land Comp 2 speed loader was also tried but did not fare well as the cartridges could not be inserted far enough into the cylinder to allow the push to release feature to work. Recoil is moderate, meaning that it is not as violent as with lighter framed revolvers or when firing plus B ammunition through those revolvers. For first time shooters, the M200 would be a good place to start them off on a journey to more powerful revolvers if they decided to choose that path. As it is, the M200 is more than adequate to launch 38 special loads. One thing about revolvers that takes some getting used to, if you are primarily shooting pistols, is the long double action pull. The second part of this is the long trigger reset. The trigger must cycle completely in both pulling and letting off of the trigger. Trigger reset in both double action and single action modes is all the way forward and it takes practice to master both. In most defensive situations, shooting in double action mode, whether one-handed or two-handed, is the dorm. If you happen to let off the trigger in mid-cycle, the cylinder does not return to the rest position. You must rotate the cylinder until it locks up after the trigger is fully released, or you can pull the trigger again. The cylinder will not turn until the hand engages the extractor start. While Ruger double action revolvers are wonderful when trying to stage the trigger, the M200 stages, just not as well. Staging comes about when, during the double action trigger pull, a short bit of slack is filled in the trigger just after cylinder lockup and just before the hammer falls. Staging a trigger allows you time to verify that the sights are in alignment before you complete the shot. Ruger double action revolvers are the kings of staging while Smith & Wesson revolvers are the queens. The M200, not so much. The M200 operates best with a quick, fast, but smooth trigger operation from start to finish. Don't be bashful about docking the hammer for a single action operation. Do it with authority. As the revolver is broken in and loosens up, a cylinder not going into lockup may disappear, or it may not. 
If the issue of not fully locking up continues, contact Rock Island Armory Customer Service for a qualified gunsmith. At times, a thorough cleaning and possibly polishing of the internals may solve the problem. At other times, the revolver may need some timing adjustments. And unless you know what the heck you are doing, I would leave that to a qualified gunsmith. In other words, seek professional help for your revolver as you may have an unsafe condition. All in all, I was satisfied with my first day of shooting the M200 and I learned quite a bit from it. Speed loaders can make inserting fresh cartridges into the cylinder much faster and easier than simply inserting the cartridges one at a time, or even with a speed strip. Using a speed loader is a challenge whether you are a left or right handed operator. The HKS D-A speed loader works well with the M200, while its Safari Land counterpart does not, as it is too thick to clear the grip to insert the cartridges in the chamber far enough for the push to release function to work. I plan on publishing a how-to video where I show you two speed loading methods for both right and left-handed shooters with any revolver. So stay tuned to the channel for that. Let's move on to carrying the M200 if that's all right with you. Some folks say that carrying a revolver is more difficult than carrying a pistol. To some degree that may be true. However, and as with a pistol, a large degree depends on the size of the firearm, the method of carry, clothing, and a host of other factors. The Rock Island Armory M200 has been compared in size to the K-frame Smith & Wesson revolvers and to some Colt revolvers of comparable size. These days, and for several reasons, aside from cold weather, I prefer shoulder holster carry, but I also carry hip or cross draw as a secondary method for short periods of time. For strong side hip carry, the Alien Gear Cloak Tuck 3.0 IWB Concealed Carry Holster for Revolvers seems to fit the bill, as this holster can be adjusted for cant and depth. While I find fully kydexed and kybrid holsters, mainly friendly to stainless steel handguns, as stainless steel can be polished, with brush stainless being the exception, handguns with parkerized or other coated finishes do not hold up in the long run. The We The People Holsters Black Concealed Carry IWB Kydex Holster that has adjustable ride, cant, and retention could also be considered. If you don't mind marring the finish on the M200 or any blued K-frame revolver, this holster may work for you. Mine is set up for cross draw carry, as I have a second holster for strong side IWB carry ordered for the M200 and other K-frame revolvers, which I talk about next. One of my favorite IWB holsters is from Felco Holsters, the A112 that, 
Law ordered for the Smith & Wesson Model 10 will also work with the M200, my Smith & Wesson Model 617, or any K-frame size revolver with a 4-inch barrel. Regardless of what I use, there are many holsters, both IWB and OWB, for K-frame revolvers that may fit your carry requirements. Note that if you carry OWB and outside of clothing, I do highly recommend a holster with a thumb brake or other retention device to eliminate the firearm from coming out of the holster when you are not in control of it. That means when bending over or to prevent someone from easily grabbing the firearm and pulling it from the holster to use against you. And with the latter in mind, I also recommend, as part of your training, to either take a course in handgun retention or read and view topics related to such and practice those techniques, with an unloaded firearm, of course. Now, let's get back to the regularly scheduled program. As with any firearm, the Rock Island Armory M200 has its foibles. One might be the sights. Please remember that combat sights have been in use for more years than I have life, and they work well in combat situations, whether for law enforcement, military, or civilians. Some might wonder about the parkerized finish. The Navy began using a parkerized finish to protect firearms from the environment long ago and it works just as well today as it did then. While not pretty, it is effective, so much so that many manufacturers use parkerizing for the same reason. It is inexpensive and protects the firearm. Some might say that the double action trigger pull is too heavy. Well, wah! A heavy double action pull on a double action only or double action single action revolver or pistol is just the nature of the beast. It is an inherent safety factor and something that can be trained through, and you should train with the firearm that you carry. The Rock Island Armory M200 is not your mommy's Glock, after all. The grips are not the best in the world. They are polymer, somewhat hard, and not contoured for every hand, and they have finger grooves. Oh, heaven help us! I have been in touch with Groundworks a manufacturer of grips for the Rock Island Armory line of 1911 pistols and revolvers. And although they do not have a current lineup of replacement grips for the M200 and M206, they are forthcoming. It's a revolver, you say. Revolvers are passe in the modern world of semi-automatic pistols. They don't carry enough ammunition. Well, my friend, what firearm does carry enough ammunition short of a belt-fed machine gun? And, for some, that would not even be enough. Revolvers have saved the bacon of many a person prior to when semi-automatic pistols were introduced, and they will continue to do so for decades to come. I am not going to get into the pros and cons of revolvers or pistols. Both have advantages and disadvantages. The person who carries one or the other, or both, needs to understand the pros and cons of each and then decide what works for their particular carry, concealment, and defensive needs. For me, I have carried both and will continue to do so. One other foible that some may comment on is that plus B ammunition cannot be used. Well, it can, just limited. If using plus B ammunition is a primary concern, you may want to go for the AL3.0 standard 357 Magnum 6 round with its 2 inch barrel. But be prepared for a not so much fun time when shooting 38 Special Plus P 
or a fully loaded 357 Magnum ammunition through one. An alternative would be the softer shooting AL9, this moon clip 9mm or 380 version, and which has a 3 inch barrel, if you can find one. I have found that a 3 inch barrel is a good trade off between a 2 inch or so barrel and a 4 inch barrel for self defense. Okay, well, is the Rock Island Army M200 a go or no go? Let's wrap this session up. When it comes to value for the money, the Rock Island Armory M200 exceeds the competition in every aspect. Of course, it has its foibles, as do other firearms in the market. The M200 is available for the budget-minded first-time gun purchaser, one who needs an excellent revolver with a mild recoil to train with or to train others, and those who just want an excellent revolver to add to an existing inventory. Whether the M200 is to be used as a truck gun, toolbox gun, fishing tackle gun, house gun, and or carried for personal protection is totally up to the user. For any choice, I believe the M200 to be a good investment. Firing 38 Special non-plus P ammunition is pleasant for the most part. 38 Special non-plus P ammunition, like the 158 grain lead semi-wad cutter hollow point, being a standard for many years, has been used effectively by military, law enforcement, and civilians over the ages, and I don't think that has changed. Current MSRP for the M200 is $249, according to the Rock Island Army website. Of course, one may be purchased for a lower cost, regardless. For that you get the head, the tail, the whole damn thing. Is the M200 a revolver for you? Yes or no? Let me know in the comment section. Once again, I come to the end of a review. I hope to post a review of the AL9 9mm revolver, which uses moon clips, at some time in the future. Until we meet again, stay safe out there. And check out the Rock Island Armory line of revolvers. You might find one that is right for you.